opportunity this morning to stand. And Reverend Maxwell, so Pastor Maxwell's absence, wherever you are, Pastor, thank you. I want to acknowledge my uh, lovely wife, Chandra. Without her, this would not be possible. She's my black Martha Stewart. She's my Esther. She's my Ruth. <laughs> And she's my Proverbs 31 woman. You see what I mean? Yes, uh, she's, I love you, honey. Uh, to my family, Byretta, Terrell, Bethany, and I think I see Bradley up there. Thank you. Love you. Thank you for being here this morning, for supporting me. There is a word from God this morning. I pray that you will have the listening ears and receptive hearts. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning, Lord God, as we always do, standing in a need for a move from you this morning, Lord God. You're welcome in this place. Send your Holy Spirit, let it fall afresh, a new anointing, Lord God, is what we're asking for this morning. And Lord, as we go into your word, Heavenly Father, let Hearts be convicted, Lord God. Let there be somebody that comes forward and says, what must I do to be saved? And Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord God. We can't do anything without you. I ask that you would increase as I decrease, Lord God. Let your word come forth. It's all about you, Lord God. It's not about me. Father, we just thank you. We honor you. We praise you. We ask it all in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning and you're able to stand, I turn your attention this morning. Our scripture is going to be coming from Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. If you're able to stand for the reading of God's word, I would appreciate it. If you're not, that's okay. We understand. Amen. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to put in at that fourth verse. So we're going to go from vo verse 4 through 7. But we're going to put in for scripture this morning, for, for text, for sermonic purposes, uh, verse 4. Amen. Let me get on even ground here and put these glasses on. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And verse 7 says, and the peace of God. And the peace of of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If I have to pick a title for this morning's message, it's going to come from that fourth verse. It's very simplistic. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'm reminded of a story where death was walking toward a man who stopped him and asked, what are you going to do? And death said, I'm going to kill 10,000 people. The man said, that's horrible. Death said, that's the way it is. It's what I do. As the day passed, the man warned everyone he could find about impending danger and death's plan. At the end of the day, he met death again. He said, you said you were going to kill 10,000, yet you killed 100,000 people. Death explained, I only killed 10,000. Worry, depression, and fear killed the others. Mm -hmm. Worry, depression, fear.
killed all the others. The worry and depression are two of the biggest problems we face in life. I'm sure, I'm sure that personally I can certainly connect with that, I'm, and I don't think I'm alone in that. And they tend to get worse as we get older. Their destruction is sure. The Mayo Clinic says worry and depression affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system, and profoundly affects our health. It's been said about the destructive force of worry and depression that worry does not empty today of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Its destruction starts like a little trickle through the mind and cuts out a furrow until it becomes a grand canyon and all other thoughts drain into it. Do you ever engage in imaginary what if thinking? Mm. Do you ever blow things up in your mind by jumping to a conclusion or making a mountain out of a molehill? That's one of my mother's favorite sayings. Have you ever looked at a dilemma and imagined the worst case scenario? Lord, <laughs> is it that bad? If you can engage, if you engage in any of these draining negative thought processes and mind games, then I stopped by this morning to tell you that God has a plan for you. And his plan is for peace and joy, not depression and worry. Amen. His plan for you is rest and peace, not turmoil and stress. So in this final message from Paul to the Philippians, he teaches how to keep depressing thoughts from robbing us of our joy. What we discover is how to have peace and joy in our relationships with God and with each other. And the way you do that is to rejoice in the Lord always, always, not sometime, always. Paul's letter to the Philippians is a meditation on joy. Paul's joy is not from ease and comfort. See, Paul went through some things. Yeah, he went through some things. And when you go through some things, then you've got a testimony. Can't have a testimony without a test, amen? And Paul certainly suffered. But Paul says he has learned, even through his suffering, that the secret to being content in any and every situation, <laughs> the secret to joy is to be content in, every, in any situation, uh, whether he was well-fed or whether he was hungry, whether he was living in plenty or whether he was living in want. Paul uses the word joy or derivative of it 16 times in Philippians. That tells you how much and how important joy is to the centralization of our spiritual connection to Christ, joy. However, the crux of the letter is in chapter four, verse four, paraphrasing Paul says, I rejoice, now you can rejoice. Paul said, I've been through it, seen it all, been deserted, bit by a snake, uh, shipwrecked, yeah. beaten, tossed out, talked about, but I'm still here, yeah. and I still got my joy. And I got my joy because I rejoice in the Lord yeah. always. Yeah. Through it all, I still rejoice. Yeah. Even in trying circumstances, I rejoice. Right. Uh, even in my captivity, I rejoice. And that's what we have to say to that cancer. Uh, you're not that strong. I'm still got my joy. Yeah. And the divorce, you still got to say, I got my joy. Yeah. Amen. It's all how you look at it. It's your perspective on life. Things aren't always as bad as they seem. Either the, some people look at the glass and it's half full, and others look at it and it's half empty. For Paul says, no matter what it is, I still got my joy. Uh, joy is a fruit of the spirit, and it's no temporary emotional quality, exalting us one moment and letting us down in the next. Uh, joy is an inner contentment not based on external circumstances. For Paul is never the victim of despair and depression, despite his outward situation. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9, Paul writes, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. I got my joy. Uh, persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And there's a lesson for all of us in there. Amen. Amen. Paul said, it might look bad right now, but I still got my joy. I, I, I might be cast down, but I'm casting my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. And my help cometh from the Lord. And Paul said, I still got my joy. And I'm rejoicing in the Lord. And I'm always rejoicing in the Lord. Paul says, I might be persecuted. People talk about me. There's nobody like this in the Lake Province. I know y'all don't talk about each other. But Paul said, even when I'm persecuted, I'm holding on to my joy. To my joy. Oh, yeah, to my joy. And Paul shares his secret for his joy in the letter to the Philippians. And Paul is, and here's the key, he's rejoicing in the Lord. Let me say that again in case that went by you. Paul's joy said, Paul says, my joy don't come from external factors. It comes from my relationship with God. I'm rejoicing in the Lord. It's right there in the scripture. Yeah, it's right there. And Paul is rejoicing in the Lord through his praising, through his, through his praying, through his worshiping, uh, through his communion with the Lord. The more and the better we, more time we spend with God, the better we get to know him. And a byproduct of that is the increase in our joy. The joy of the Lord is his strength, and it can be ours too. I'm reminded of Nehemiah when Nehemiah was building the temple. The two of his buddies, uh, Sinbalad and Tobias, stopped by. You know, when you're trying to do a work for the Lord, there's always going to be somebody that's got something to say about what you're doing. Well, they came by, and Nehemiah looked down at him. He had his sword in one hand, and he was working with the other, doing his work for God. Uh, he didn't let this negative stuff these two knuckleheads was talking about just stop him. Nehemiah said, look, I don't know what y'all got to do, but I'm going to tell you, I'm not listening to that noise because the joy of the Lord is my strength. See, sometimes you just have to praise God anyhow. You have to press your way through it. You have to hold your hand up with your sword in one hand and keep doing the work for God in the other and declare the joy of the Lord is my strength. See, it's all in how you look at it. It's all in how you look at it. Don't let that negativity stop you. Don't let it rob you of your joy because whenever you're doing the work for God, trust me, Satan is going to be right beside you sending his little imps or making a personal appearance, right, right, to try to disrupt what you're doing. But do like Nehemiah did, amen. Just say, hey, look, let me tell you something. The joy of the Lord mm -hmm, is my strength. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let's unpack this Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 4, and see what Paul is saying about joy. Excuse me, about living <clears throat> a truly Christian life <clears throat> that places circumstances and worry under spiritual control. <clears throat> Excuse me. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Uh, the joy that we're talking about here can be experienced always. Paul says that. It's right there in the text. Not just an occasional experience for exceptional people, but it can be experienced in darkness or in light, in trials or in triumphs, not just for apostles, but for Christians. Romans 5, 3, and 4 puts it this way. We are also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, which is faith. Amen. Amen. So you have to, uh, uh, this joy is for everyone. You can always experience it. And, and, and we consider the example of Paul who found his joy 
always. He found it in his prayers for the saints. When we pray one for the other, we should be joyful in our ability to lift somebody else up before God. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's part of beloved community. That's what saints of God do. And we see that in Paul's proclamation of the gospel under adverse circumstances, he was able to find his joy. You remember his, his uh, episode at uh, Lystra, right? When they threw him out of the city and stoned him and left him out there for dead. And Paul backed up and brushed himself off and got up and went right back into the city preaching. And then went back on another journey. Joy. <laughs> joy in the Lord. That's what joy in the Lord would do for you. It'll give you strength. It'll make you go back to where your enemy tried to defeat you. It'll make you turn a tragedy into a triumph. Rejoice in the Lord always. Well, we see that Paul rejoices always, but, but what was his secret? Hmm. What was the source of this abiding joy? His abiding joy is in the Lord. There, I would offer to you that there are two types of joy, uh, temporary or illusionary joy. And then there's abiding joy, the joy that is within, that stays inside, that's, a, that's internal, that, 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 that is contentment, mm. contentment. Temporary joy, let's look at that for a moment, it, it can be found in drugs and alcohol, tobacco, but these are only fleeting and, and, and damaging things to the temple, which is the body of God. And it also can be found in material acquisitions, this temporary joy, including the big one of all, money. Mm. But as Christ said in the parable to the rich young ruler in Luke 12, uh, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21, I'm paraphrasing now. He said, you build bigger barns, you fool, and yet I may require your life this very day. Now tell me, who's going to reap? Who's going to reap? the rewards of your work. If you're gone, what good is that big barn going to do you? Amen? Your, your God can't be your money. It can't be your job. It can't be your spouse. It's got to be God and God alone. Somebody hear me here. That's where you find your joy, in the Lord. Amen? Amen. So, I'm reminded of this little story that I was, uh, as I was preparing for this, I ran across this little story that equates to temporary joy and disillusionment. Two old friends met each other on the street one day. One looked sad and almost on the verge of tears. His friend asked him, what has happened to you, my old friend? The sad fellow said, let me tell you, three weeks ago, my uncle died and left me $40,000. That's a lot of money, said the friend. But you see, the sad man continued, two weeks ago, a cousin I never knew died and left me $85,000 free and clear. And the friend replied, hmm, that sounds like you've been, you're on a roll. You've been, you've been blessed. You don't understand, the sad fellow replied. Last week, my great aunt passed away. I inherited almost a quarter of a million dollars. Now the friend was really confused as to why the guy looked sad. The friend said, then why are you so sad? The guy replied, this week, nobody died, and I didn't get anything. <laughs> Temporary joy. Fleeting joy. Disillusioned joy. Here one minute, gone the next. But the joy that we want to talk about this morning, my brothers and sisters, as we work through this text, is the joy that abides only in the Lord. In other words, that which comes from a personal, living, and fruitful relationship with the Lord. For in the Lord, we enjoy peace with God. We look at verse 7, Philippians verse 7, it says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ 
Jesus. So when we're in the Lord, we have the peace of God, and we have peace with God. Uh, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty, pretty good idea to me. That's something that I, I really want to have. That's the thing that keeps me going into my word. Uh, that's the thing that keeps me praying to God. Uh, that's the thing that keeps me worshiping him. That's the thing that I strive to walk upright before him because I want to have his peace. And when you have his peace, you can then have his joy because his joy is in the Lord. Amen. That's where it is. And we just have to set up our perspectives. We have to set up our priorities to determine what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. Amen. Amen. We want the abiding joy. And then the abiding joy in the Lord helps us in temptations. Amen. And no temptation can overtake us where God has not made a way to escape or the strength to overcome it. We can do all things through Christ Jesus who what? Strengthens us in the Lord, in his abiding joy, this relationship, this personal living relationship with Christ. And then thirdly, abiding in the Lord is the assurance, and this is the one I really like, the assurance of God's companionship in time of trial and worry. Verse 6, if we turn our attention to verse 6, if you have your Bible still, Philippians 4 and 6 says, Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and what? Supplication with what? Thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Assurance. Assurance. These are the sorts of things that, apply, that provide a true and a lasting joy. I don't know about you, but I'm happy that I got a God that when I'm worried about something, and we all worry, whether we look like it or not. Trust me, I'm standing up here this morning. The Lord knows I don't look like what I've been through. But in the name of Jesus, I got my joy this morning. And I know that I'm happy because God has delivered me. He has saved me. Amen. He's taken all those things away that used to bother and trouble me. Oh, yeah, I'm a little concerned every now and then. But I'm not worried about anything. As Martin Luther King said the night before, he said, I'm not worried about any man. Because my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. See, Martin has a good message in that. When you're in the Lord, Martin had joy even before, and I prophetically believed that he knew he was, something was going to happen really soon. But Martin didn't let it rob him of his joy. He still proclaimed it, even up until the very end. And that's what I'm imploring you to do this morning, saints. Claim your joy. It's yours. It's yours. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we were able to experience this abiding joy, well, why don't we? Why do so many of us have a personal relationship with the Lord and still we're lacking with joy in most all circumstances? Well, let's take a look at that. Perhaps it's because uh, memories of the past failures and aware awareness of present faults often leaves people in a state of disillusionment and discouragement and depression. I failed. I, I have to make it. I fall short. Well, the truth of the matter is, saints, we all fall short. All right. It's how you look at it. It's what your perspective is. Amen. Paul, however, provides the solution to Philippians 3 and verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own. Mm -hmm, because Christ Jesus has made me his own relationship. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. You can't do nothing about yesterday. That's gone. But you can take agency for today, and you can take agency for your future. It's in your perspective. And when you have that abiding joy in Christ Jesus, then you don't worry about what the circumstances or outlook is. You can enjoy the journey as you're on your way. You can pray with belief and you can operate and worship in belief that no matter what comes, 
whether I'm abased or I abound, as Paul said, I'm going to be all right. I still got my joy. I still got my joy. We have to realize that we're imperfect beings. We're not perfect. But we should press on to better things. Forget your past failures. Reach forward to your future successes with joy in the Lord always. And then there's a natural temperament or disposition which causes a lack of joy. Many people are naturally melancholy through genetic disposition. You know, my mama was like that or my daddy was like that, you know, what I'm saying, with an attitude that, and then some people are affected by their environmental influences as we were growing up. Yet in Christ Jesus, we, be, we can be transformed. Just because it started out that way, it doesn't have to stay that way. Right, Romans 1 and 2 tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of our minds. Amen. And when you renew that mind, you can grasp that significance of being in the Lord always, rejoicing always, regardless of what the circumstances might appear to be. And then the fruit of the Spirit. See, we can, when, we, when, we, when we have the fruit of the Spirit, we have joy. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Joy. And then... Depressing circumstances can cause a lack of joy. It's easy to be joyful when everything's going well. Anybody been there? Okay. You don't have to raise your hand. But when things go wrong, oh, well, we go into our Marvin Gaye impression. And I'm going to date myself now, okay? I'm an old school R&B aficionado, so I know who Marvin is. If we go into our Marvin Gaye impression, it reminds me of that 1971 song Marvin had, Inner City Blues, Make Me Want to Holler. Anybody remember that song? Uh, okay. Mm. No, no, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I thought about it, Red, but I said, no, no, I'm going to stay here while I am. But here's where Marvin introspectively, introspectively offers this socially poignant viewpoint on black urban life, as he says, the way they do my life, throw up both my hands, make me want to holler. The way they do my life, this ain't living. No, this ain't living. Mm, no, this ain't living. The way they do my life, the way I got to deal with this oppression inside of this circumstance, no, this ain't living. The way I have to wake up in a blighted neighborhood every morning, no, this ain't living. The way I have to put it with a racial oppression and degradation and discrimination, no, this ain't living. No, this ain't living. Marvin was on to something. And because what Marvin was really talking about was a lack, lack, rather, a lack of joy to have a full life. And when we're not living fully and there's a lack in our life and joy is not present, it is depressing. It does make you want to holler. It seems like the world's moving by you and you're the only one standing still. So Marvin, you know, Marvin really, really was on to something. But even in that, the scriptures tell us that even in our trials and our tribulations, we should joy in them. And how can you do that? You can do that because you're in the Lord. It's all about your perspective. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And that endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. See, when you become a mature Christian, you have your joy. When, you don't, when you're not lacking in anything, you have your joy. When you have the proper spiritual perspective on your life, you have your joy. Amen? It's about how you think about it. I know I keep saying that, but I want to impress upon you. Sometimes the way our situations play themselves out and portray in our mind, it's not really as bad as it seems. We spend more time thinking about what we don't have instead of praising God and thanking him for what we do have. Amen? Be happy with where you are, whether you're a base or whether you are bound. Still have your joy in the Lord. So we get to the part that I like in, in my sermons, and that's the application, right? So we examine abiding joy. So how can it be applied to our lives, this joy I'm talking about? 
Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'm almost done. I'll be out of your way in a, in a couple minutes. Rejoice in the Lord always means that do not let the dark realities of life blind us to the radiance of joy. Right? Don't get hung up in the forest because of the trees, so to speak. Things aren't always as bad as they seem. Perspective. How do you look at this thing? How are you transforming your mind to, to, to move into a good place? You have the option. Brothers and sisters, take agency for your joy. Joy is found in the Lord. If you haven't figured it out by now in the last 12 minutes, joy is in the Lord. I implore, I implore you to make relationships with the Lord, and the, one, and the relationships ought to be first way to start it is by Rending, rendering complete obedience to his will. Sometimes I used to be my own worst enemy in terms of being blessed by God. I had this, I had that, I, I went here, I, I went there, I, I had received things from this person and, and that person, and, and nothing made me happy. Nothing. Until one day, I came into the obedience of the will of God. I transformed my mind. I put on a different perspective. I reclaimed my joy. Amen. And now some of the places I used to go, I don't go anymore. Some of the people I used to hang around, I don't hang around them anymore. See, and one of the type of people is that if people can't get with you in your joy, check them off. Check them off. You don't need them. Amen? Because people will hate on your joy. That's one way to know that you, that you are really happy and in the Lord. When all that old other stuff starts falling off and, and they start pulling that, well, you ain't all that. No, that's all right. No, I'm fine. I got Jesus. Who you got? <laughs> Amen? Right. Right. And, and then another way that we can make a relationship and put, that puts us in the Lord is by letting the counsel of his Holy Spirit word give us the perspective necessary to rejoice in the Lord always. Christians should not be sad people, right? Christians should be joyful people. We have an eternal Savior, one who came to make a blood sacrifice for us, right? And, and so we should be happy. We know how the story ends. If you don't want to read all the way through the Bible, just read the last book, and you'll know that we win. Hold on to your joy. You got something to be happy about. Christians shouldn't be sad. Joy resides not in our circumstances or these, this positive universalistic thinking that's so prevalent in the world today. Joy reigns in the heart and in the heart only. When Christ is Lord of your life, joy is always present. When Christ is Lord of your life, Joy is always present. When Christ is Lord of your life, joy is always present. So if you don't have any joy, check yourself. See if God is in there. See if Christ is in there. You make time for all these other things. Are you making time for God? It has to be a personal relationship. Right? It has to be a personal relationship relationship. The joy that Christians have should not be hindered by any afflictions uh, from our enemies that they can try to imagine on us or work against us. But more importantly, our joy should not be hindered by our self-doubt or worry or debasing thoughts that we conjure up in our own mind. That's where the battlefield is, people. The battlefield is right here, right between these ears, right? That's where Satan comes at you first. Because whatever a man thinketh, so is he. Careful about what you think. You have the agency to think in a joyful way. You have agency to think in terms of being in Christ. The choice is yours. Rejoice in the Lord always. So, as I close this morning, brothers and sisters, I want to exhort you to rejoice in the Lord always. For he is the God of all comfort and peace, standing ready to be with us in our trials and our tribulations. 
to give us rest and not stress, peace and not confusion, joy and not strife. And before I sit down, I want you to know one thing, that I have joy this morning. I have joy because I've been a sinner saved by his grace. I've been redeemed. I have joy in the midnight hour. I have joy in the morning time. I have joy in the midst of my circumstances. I have joy that surpasses all understanding. Now, I got joy this morning. I have joy that the world didn't give. And you know what? The world can't take it away. Mm -hmm. I got joy in the peace of God. I've got joy with God. I got joy for the breath that God has placed in my body on this day. I got joy because when I looked in the mirror this morning, I knew where that handsome fellow was looking back at me. I got joy. I got joy because I know that on this, when this old journey is over with, that I got a place that I'm going to go, that I'm going to be in the house of God forever in his eternal graces. And my place is already provided for me. And I have joy knowing that God, God will guard my heart and my mind. In Christ Jesus. Anybody in here got joy this morning? Raise your hand. You got some joy? You got some joy? Is there anybody here that just say that, Lord, I thank you that I didn't lose my mind over that situation. Lord, thank you for making that cancer go away. Lord, I'm joyful I have a family and my friends. Lord, you are the joy of my life. Anybody here got joy this morning that makes you look crazy to your neighbor because you are praising and worshiping? Right, you, but what you're doing, you got a purpose because you're happy about it and joyful about that grace and mercy that you know that God has given you. If it had not been for the Lord that was on my side, that's something to be happy about, something to be joyful about. I got joy. I got joy. I got unspeakable joy. Joy, joy. Joy. I got joy. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.